Hello, I hope you all like our new introduction. Uh, my name is Tom Beltres, and I would like to welcome you to this Porous Media Tea Time talk. Um, I'm here today with Kamal Singh, Catherine Spuren, and Mohamed Nuraipur. And two other members of our organizing team are Maya Rukur and Marcel Moura, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Uh, Porous Media Tea Time Talks, to remind you, is meant to give a platform to junior, media, uh, junior porous media scientists and is complementary to the geoscience and geoenergy talks in our featured channels. Uh, with that, I will uh, hand over to Mohamed, who will chair our first talk of the day. Thank you very much, Tom. Today's first presentation is by Filippo Miele. Filippo completed his master's in statistical physics at the University of Florence, focusing on pattern formation hosted on network type support. Then he did his PhD between the CIS Institute in Barcelona and the University of Luzon under the supervision of Professor Marco Dens and Professor Pietro Diana, where he per performed experiments for studying the filtration of colloids and biocolloids. Today, he gave a presentation on the filtration by cross media. Thank you, Filippo, for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Okay, so just to give a small introduction, filtration is basically a two-phase separation process where you want to separate the solid party from the fluid phase where they are suspended. Now, among the three processes, the three mechanisms that drive filtration, which are physical strainings, immobilization by a stagnation zone and, and uh, absorption, we will focus on absorption as soon as it couples uh, the two uh, mechanisms of transport and uh, reaction. Indeed, absorption occurs when particles are transported close to the surface of the grain or the solid matrix and they interact between them. Now, the interaction is encoded in a general way by the uh, DLVO theory, which tells you that once the particles get really close to the surface of the grain, the uh, overall energy profile that the particle felt, which is represented here from this solid line, came from the balance between the attracted potential and the um, repulsive uh, potential. Now, the particles uh, can be uh, filtrated, so permanent, uh, trapped if it's able to cross uh, the energy barrier. Now, the most uh, successful uh, uh, attempt to describe uh, filtration by coupling reaction and transport uh, is represented by the Apple uh, sphere model, which uh, tells you that given a certain representative uh, portion of your porous media, you can model it with a single sphere and a liquid envelope. Now, among all the particles that are flowing uh, through the porous media, here represented by the, by the area A2, only a small portion of them passing through the size, uh, the area of size A1 can get in contact with the collector, so with the filter. Now the size of A1 is driven by gravity, Brannan motion, and the flow. Once the particle get close to the surface, then the electrostatic interaction is triggered, the particle has non-zero probability to be attached. Now in this framework, so the concentration of the retained, so attached particles named with A, is just proportional with the concentration of the still fluid uh, flowing part. So the suspended particles here named with C. And the attachment rate, so the constant that gives you the um, retained particles, is uh, nothing else than the ratio between the two area A1 and A2. Now, in this framework, so filtration by the porous media is just a collection, a sequence of scattering event. And the two main diagnostic microscopic quantities that describe filtration are the breath recurves, which is the distribution of arrival times at a given distance at the reference plane, and the deposition profile, which is the concentration of the attached particles along the distance of the filter. Now, the underlying hypothesis be uh, behind this theory is that after each collision, the concentration of the still survived, so of the C suspended particles, is homogenized. This means uh, that uh, the CFT, so the classical theory, assumes the existence of an REB over which the particles are filtrated uh, with a constant rate. Now, 
uh, within this framework, so the classical framework, is possible to describe filtration by the classical advection diffusion reaction equation. Uh, you can see the terms of diffusion of the drift terms and the filtration rate. And uh, it's quite easy to derive that in case that we can neglect dispersion, uh, uh, sorry, diffusion, which is the case of uh, high uh, pickling number, so the deposition profile is supposed to decay as an exponential uh, slope. Now, several other data collected in the lab that show that the position profile is not following an exponential decay. The hypothesis, which is the main hypothesis of, of my work, is that, okay, at this stage, we completely neglect the heterogeneity come, comes, that comes from the flow, and so we want to investigate the role of such heterogeneity for the deposition profile. Now, uh, what we start is that at the just the level of the simulation, so we uh, employ this uh, uh, 2D heterogeneity porous media where the grain uh, is represented by these gray circles. And uh, this porous material, this porous media is characterized by a given specific uh, power law distribution for the pore size. Now, solving the Stokes uh, equation, so we have the flow field here uh, representing the color map. And, um, and, uh, and then simulating a 2D Lagrangian trajectory, we saw that for this case, the velocity exhibits a strong spatial correlation, as you can see from the tailing of the autocorrelation function of velocity. Now, if we define a criteria to measure such spatial correlation, is it possible to build the distribution of such spatial correlation? Now, uh, within this framework, uh, we can model, we can interpret filtration as a sequence of random events, where at each step, so the particles is crossing a given a jump length of a distributed correlation length, is crossing this jump with a given distributed velocity, and it's subjected to a given attachment rate. Now, uh, to validate our uh, stochastic interpretation filtration, we need an experimental setup that allows us to make both a micro microscopic observation of a breakthrough curve and deposition profile, at the same time, so also the microscopic uh, pore scale uh, analysis. So that's why we decide to go for a microfluidics approach. So here you can see uh, the chip, the scheme of the chip that we employ for uh, our experiment. So the total length is a bit less than one meter. And, uh, and again, the pore size has been characterized by the Delaunay triangulation and it follows a power law distribution for the pore size. Here on the bottom, you have an idea of the size of the chip which fits in one end, and then we perform experiment by fluorescent microscopy of both deposition profile and breakthrough hoods. Uh, so the flow system was represented in this way. So we uh, collect by time lapse an uh, image acquisition at the outlet the concentration of the still flowing particles in order to, uh, to measure the time dependency of the breakthrough hoods. And then for the deposition profile, we scan in 28, but it can be extended to whatever is the number of the point that you want to sample. We uh, sample, so in 28 uh, different position, the deposition profile. Here you see an example of the flow system. So we continuously inject the particles, so fluorescent particles. And then the flow rate that we choose was in order to have a mean uh, velocity of uh, um, 150 around microns per second, which correspond to a pickling number of 10 to the power spore. Uh, so we use the magnification 6x six, six, uh, six uh, um, for the objective and the colloidal suspension, we, uh, in order to avoid gravity uh, effect at this stage, so we use a density match suspension by adding heavy water to, uh, water to just pure water. And uh, in this case, for this preliminary experiment, we work at zero ionic strength. So this means that we didn't add any salt to the colloidal suspension. So just to have a look directly at the data, we saw that if you look at the breakthrough curves uh, working at zero ionic strength, 91% of the particle has been recovered at the outlet of the filter. And uh, it's, but it's more interesting uh, have a, in uh, looking at the complementary breakthrough curves, which is defined like one minus the current concentration divided by the injected concentration, which show a tailing, a power law tailing behavior 
with the arrival times with a characteristic exponent of minus 0 0.63. While with the same experimental setup, we measured the deposition profile. And here you can see that after 30 hours of injection, even uh, working at zero ionic strength, we were able to collect a deposition profile. So, so we are in front of a clear pattern deposition profile, and uh, it seems to be an anomalous deposition profile. As soon as it has this power low behavior for more than two order of magnitude, and then it exhibits these strange peaks close to the outlet. Now, the advantage of our experimental setup is that it's possible to find the link between the macroscopic observation of the breath recruits and the deposition profile with the post-case process by particle tracking. Now, the complexity of uh, um, this confined, heterogeneous confined geometry um, requires that uh, we need to write from zero our particle tracking scheme. For which reason? Here you can see that uh, uh, while the deposition profile and the breakthroughs has been collected in fluorescent channels, so we were able to detect only particles, for the particle tracking, uh, as soon as the trajectory, they had been, they are uh, compressed and stretched, we have to work in phase contrast uh, microscopy. So this means that this allowed us that um, uh, we collect at a high um, frame rate, so 60 frame rate per second, with the two uh, millisecond exposure times. And here you can see the grains, um, one on average size of uh, uh, 60 uh, microns, and the colloids that are represented with these black uh, dots that are flowing. Now, as I said before, the complexity of uh, uh, such systems require to write from zero to particle tracking. Why? I will show I will, I will briefly show the reason of such challenging uh, tracking. So usually most of the algorithms that uh, are employed in uh, tracking particles uh, are based by the fact that for each frame, you assign coordinates to the particle that you are able to detect. Then you have to link the candidates, so you have to link the pair coordinate between two consequent frames. So the most uh, used, so, in this case, uh, you can see that uh, your brain will intuitively assign the following particles at a given frame and then the next one and the next one. Now, to translate what your brain is doing in just an algorithm, uh, most of the algorithms they are using the nearest neighbor criteria, which means that at each step, uh, at a given frame, you are searching for the closest candidates in the next frame, and in that case will be the best candidate. Now, you can see that if it, this works, uh, for example, for this case, it, the criteria may uh, fail in case that you have two or more candidates, so two or more uh, closer particles within a given uh, distance. And, it, and uh, if you are using the criteria of minimizing the distance, you may also assign the wrong candidate to such particles. Now, to avoid to overcome this problem, we decide to uh, okay, uh, by the fact that we uh, acquire image at a quite high fast uh, rate acquisition, and uh, that that makes that the trajectory of the particles was pretty smooth, we decide to change the algorithm of the particle tracking in this way. So, given by the first pay, we were able to um, uh, somehow compute the local velocity that the particle feels. Then we make a prediction of where the particle could be in the next frame, and then we are searching for a candidate with a new predicted location in a, radi in a, um, in a distance which is smaller than the one that the, neighbor, uh, the, the nearest neighbor uh, required. Now, with this uh, particle tracking scheme, then we were able to uh, collect and track particles over three different fields of view, which means that we collect particles, we, um, um, we track particles for six minutes in one field of view, then we move the state, and we collect particles for other six minutes, and then going on uh, until... Um, and, and then you go on until you reach the, max, the maximum distance uh, in trajectory that you want to uh, observe. Here you can see so the result of the three uh, stick um, field of view, and here you see the details and the quality of our particle tracking, and at this stage you can see the effect of the diffusion. Now, 
by um, tracking the, so reconstructing the, the Lagrangian trajectory, we define a criteria to uh, measure the correlation length. And so the correlation length is the pieces along a single trajectory over which the particle get closer at a given distance to the closest grain. So for our uh, experimental setup, we decided this uh, uh, threshold distance was fixed with two microns. So by uh, identifying the point where the particle get close enough to the grains, we put a flag. Then between two flags, for us, this is a correlation length. Now, sampling this correlation length of an arbitrary number of particles that has been tracked, and then by deriving the uh, transition velocity of, uh, uh, that, the, that the particle needed to cross this uh, correlation length, we were able to be the PDF of correlation length velocity DF, and velocity DF and attachment rate. Now, for the, um, for the PDF, so we see that the PDF that we measure by our particle tracking gave us um, rotation PDF, so correlation uh, length with a negative slope of the uh, exponent minus 0 0.4. So I want to stress a bit uh, between the meaning of this uh, power law distributed correlation length, which somehow breaks uh, the concept of the existence of a single REV, so a single length scale. Now, for the, um, by the same particle tracking, we were able to measure the velocity PDF, and then for the attachment rate, if for the attachment rate, we employ a result, um, a result that has been derived and measured by science and collaborators where they measured for a straight channel and a deposition profile of uh, um, that scale with an exponent of minus 0 0.5 and attachment rate that decays with, um, uh, so it corresponds with an attachment rate that decays with this characteristic exponent. Now, now that we built our PDF, we are able to run our stochastic model. So the stochastic model tells, is, is written in this way. So at each step, you draw a given uh, jump length, correlation length, and a given velocity. By the ratio between the jump length and the velocity uh, given, um, driven by the PDF, we can compute a Transient, uh, transient time, so not a vector time. Then, by a given value of the attachment rate, we can compute the filtration times. Uh, so now, the competition between the advective time, that's the, that, that is the time that the particle needed to cross, uh, to make the jump, and the filtration times, uh, the times that the, that the particle has to, cross, to make this jump, uh, tells you the fate of the particles. Now, in case that the advective time is below the decay time, so the party will survive, and then you update each time the new position. While if the, trans, uh, the transient time is higher than the filtration times, the particle is considered deposited, and, this, and the position profile is computed. If the particles reach the outlet, then uh, the BTC in that case, so the British cruise, is then computed. Now, just having a look at the uh, comparison between the CTRW, so the, the simulation that we did with experimental data, we saw that for the PDF that we use in the first case, uh, the, simulation is, uh, the simulation are able to reproduce the early transient behavior of the breakthrough hoods, but they completely fail in describing the long tail behavior of the breakthrough hoods. And this is uh, typical of uh, quite, uh, let's say, homogeneous porous media, which means that uh, you are allowed to uh, average on the velocity and just consider the mean velocity. And this is uh, uh, quite obvious. Uh, as soon as if we look at the PDF that we were able to measure with the particle tracking, of course, uh, it shows a peak on the mean velocity, while the low velocity, the extremely low velocity, they are quite unlikely to be, cho to be chosen. Then, on the other side, we saw that if we look at the deposition profile, so the comparison between our model and the deposition profile, we observe that the model is not able to catch the, uh, last the large distance deposition profile. 
which comes from the fact that the, the correlation length that we sample, uh, of course, uh, the maximum distance uh, was uh, uh, the maximum distance that we were able to collect was given by uh, the number of uh, the the field of view that where we performed the particle tracking. So we were in front of two problems. So the first is that uh, um, so our particle tracking is affected by finite time windows because of course we cannot uh, um, track particles uh, for an infinity amount of time. And then, so in our case, we were tracking party for just six minutes. And then the other problem is that the, the party of tracking is affected by finite space windows, which means that the, uh, the maximum, uh, uh, theoretically, the maximum correlation length that you can measure is the number of field of view that uh, along you track the particles. So to solve the problems in a, in a theoretical paper that, um, um, that I previously uh, published, um, that uh, uh, that uh, show how the deposition profile is affected by uh, the three uh, random variables. We saw that uh, in this case, to overcome the undersampling of low of low velocity, we derived that uh, the early distance deposition profile, so these slopes, um, is driven is mainly driven by the slope. So actually, it has exactly the same slope of the power law. Um, velocity PDF, while on the other case, to overcome the problem of the finite size space uh, of the space window, the correlation length, we extend the correlation uh, length PDF with the total, with the maximum length of the of the hour chip. Now, by changing so by changing the slope of the low velocity for the velocity PDF and just extend, extending the range of the correlation length, so the relation PDF, uh, by keeping the same slope, we uh, got a much better agreement between our simulation and, and the data. So indeed, the model tends to a bit uh, overpredict the early arrival times, but it completely uh, describe the tailing behavior of the breakthrough hoods. And uh, the agreement, and we get a better agreement for the deposition profile, while this strange peak close to the outlets is still, uh, let's say, under investigation. And uh, with this, uh, I conclude the presentation. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you, Fari, for this for this wonderful talk. Uh, I would like to uh, ask our audience if they have any questions and comments, please post on on your right hand side window. Uh, we got the first question from of, of Catherine. Uh, she's asking how challenging would it be to convert your approach to three D? Um, if you can, I think visualize all the stuff through the. Okay, so actually, I, I just applied for a fellowship to uh, <laughs> to go to Davis and then mm -hmm. try to make uh, the same analysis on a real 3D porous material. So the thing is that in that case, we reproduce a real soil rock sample. So there is a real structures. Then we will make exactly the same, um, we will follow the same scheme. We will solve the flow. We will simulate the Lagrangian trajectory. So we will measure again the correlation length. And with the, and with the column, we will mm. compare with the deposition profile and breakthrough hoods. So actually, I mean, this is exactly the next step that we are going to, that I'm going to do if, if I will get the fellowship. Sure, sure. Good luck with that. Uh, I've got a quick question. Uh, it's, it's probably naive or, let's say, more technical. Uh, you showed the experimental case, which is actually impressive and complex at the same time, the, the design is there. So you used uh, a Paclin number uh, of four. I think there was a certain flow rate there. Uh, I was wondering if, because you're tracking particles there, is there any higher velocity like limit you can track the particle with a certain accuracy. Yeah, clearly. So uh, indeed, this is the mean velocity. But then, of course, uh, 
due to the uh, distribution of port size, uh, you have uh, so the higher velocity is like could yeah. be like uh, 10 or 50 or 100 times the mean velocity. Yeah. So um, there is a limitation of the particle tracking, and then in that case, uh, you have to find a good compromise between the mean velocity, which is something that mm -hmm. you can tune um, with the syringe pump, so by imposing the flow rate, and also the uh, let's say the concentration of the colloidal suspension. So if you want to go faster, then it's better to use uh, a low uh, concentration. So in that case, uh, you are increasing the interparticle distance, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, you can tune the parameter where to find uh, the best uh, candidate between two frames. So if the part, so basically this is a parameter of the particle tracking that it tells you which is the high so which is the maximum distance over which you may found two candidates which is given by the maximum velocity and the frame rate at which you are collecting particles okay wonderful thank you very much uh, anybody has question from the studio if not i would like to thank you Filippo, for this wonderful wonderful talk and Thank you for, for coming to the studio and joining us today. Thank you. And we wish you good luck for your future career and also for your grant, for the fellowship grant. OK, thank you. OK, so uh, let's move on to our second speaker, uh, Saurabh Singh. Uh, he's, from, he's from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And he's recently defended his PhD thesis. He's worked on granular materials and particularly uh, cemented granular materials. So he currently works at ISC, uh, Indian Institute of Science, and works on mechanics of soils. So today he's going to present uh, his work on termiteness, uh, which is uh, quite close to me as well because we've been started, we've been doing this work only for recently for about two years, and this is a very fascinating topic. So I'm looking forward to it, and thank you again, uh, Saurabh, for joining us today. And the floor yeah. is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Kamal. So, yeah, good evening. My name is Saurabh, and I'm going to present our work on termite mounts. The title of my presentation is a Living Porous Media, Biology and Engineering of Termite Mount Construction. This is the outline of my presentation. So first, I'll introduce animal beta structure in that termite mounts and termites. And then I'll enlist the objective of this study, following which I'll uh, talk about the results which I've, I've got from our experiments and then I'll conclude the presentation. Now coming to the animal bed structure. So in nature, we found animal bed structure around us all the times. And these structures are used for different purposes, such as for shelter, for protection from predators, for catching prey, for reproduction, and for thermal regulation and ventilation. The material used for in these uh, structures could be exogenous material, or it could be endogenous material, or it could be combination of these. Exogenous material is the material which is coming from outside of the species, that is collected material such as mud, wood, leaves, and feathers. Uh, endogenous material is the self-secretion of the from the insect or from the animal. And the hybrid material is, as I told you, is the combination of the two. In case of termite mounds, uh, the mounds are uh, used by termite for shelter and thermal regulation and ventilation purposes. Now, now, these termites are found across the globe near the tropical and subtropical regions, such as in Australia, India, Africa, South America. Now, coming to the termites, termites are highly social, social insects, which have evolved from cockroaches. There are more than 3,000 known species of termites around the world, and a fraction of them make termite mounds, and a subset of these will further grow, uh, cultivate a fungus, farming guard, a fungus farming garden inside the termite mound, which will be used for food. Now, the, there are three castes of termite mound. There's, there's a major worker, minor worker, and soldier. The major and minor worker do most of the work, and soldier is uh, basically protecting the colony. The termite mound can be thought as extended phenotype of uh, termites. Uh, the, the size of the mound is three orders of magnitude larger than the termite. So it, a termite would be of size, let's say, a few mm, and the termite mound would be a few meters. 
the termite mound can endure several decades much longer than the life of the termite or termite colony uh, it provides a controlled environment for termites and it is also useful for uh, uh, thermal regulation for fungus garden so uh, here uh, there is this fungal comb that is at the base of the termite mound and this is the food that they use to eat okay now coming to the process of construction of termite mound so basically termite takes the nearby soil and they form a small boluses these boluses are basic building block of the termite mound they go and deposit it on the site and because of the consolidation process and uh, wetting drying cycle and uh, so basically the mound is constructed and the structure of the mound is controlled by gravity wetting drying and uh, remolding in the case when there is a breach by an external agent so now coming to the objective of this study so it is known that the termite mounds have high strength and also good ventilation these two objectives are sort of competing in one sense so to, we we here try to understand what how they are achieving this uh, this competing objective so we study the termite mound at different so cross sections so so we take the uh, different cross sections of the mounds at different heights and study study the variation of uh, their mechanical properties or, or their hydraulic properties so we further study the stability of the mound slope so in this study we have used two mounds one was abandoned mound that is dead mound there was no termites in it and the other was live mound in case of abandoned mound we have sectioned it at different cross sections at different heights and our focus is primarily to understand the behavior or the properties distribution along the cross section so we will we have identified two things one is the buttress which is outer wall of the termite mound and then the core which is inner region inside the mound in the, uh, so we have also studies uh, studied on the uh, live mound in the case of live mound the ex uh, samples were extracted uh, it, this was not uh, sectioned and the samples were ex uh, extracted at two heights 0.9 meter and 1.2 meter from the base now so we perform very simple experiments so first of all we we do a, a Uniaxial compression test on micro universal testing machine. So, because the specimen size is restricted uh, to around 10 to 20 mm, so we obtain a cylindrical specimen of size 10 mm cross 20 mm height. And uh, for porosity, we use X ray computer tomography. And then for air permeability, we have a custom made glass T tube. So, I'll just tell you about the custom made glass T tube. So in this one, we have a porous, uh, we have a pressure transducer, and uh, at one end of the glass T tube, we have sealed our mound sample, and from the other end, we are supplying the air. So basically, permeability is measured through an indicator. The indicator is the pressure required to maintain a certain velocity. Let's say I have maintained certain velocity. What is the amount of pressure required? So through that, we are measuring the permeability of air through this media. Okay. Now coming to the results. So, uh, so the the test was performed at core and buttress at different heights. So if you see in the abandoned mode, you can clearly see that that the core has higher strength in comparison to the buttress at around all the heights for both in case of abandoned mind, mound and in case of live mound also, we see quite difference, quite a bit of difference between core and the buttress. So it tells us that the mound is a bilayered structure. It has a strong core and a weaker buttress. Now coming to the porosity too. So basically we have taken uh, samples and put it in CT. And so to get the uh, porosity distribution, we have binarized this uh, X-ray CT volume, and uh, then uh, in this binary binary uh, volume, we have two phases, whites and soil, and we are throwing random cubes at different locations, and we are measuring the porosity of each cube, and through that, we have obtained the porosity distribution. So if you look at the porosity the distribution at different heights, you could clearly make out that, so the red, plot is for core and blue plot is for the buttress. So at the top of the mound, you have 
higher porosity at and the buttress and so top and middle of the mound buttress is more porous and then the core at the bottom of the mound core has higher pore sizes in comparison to buttress so it, this again tells us that the, the core at the top and middle region is much more denser than the buttress now coming to the air permeability so here i'm showing you pressure versus flow velocity plot so as you can see that for for at different heights so a2 a4 a7 are different heights for each height we have we we re will require more pressure for to maintain certain velocity for the core in comparison to buttress as you can see here like blue plot versus green plot and for 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 all the heights we have immaterial of height or at every place we have seen that the core is much more is is relatively impermeable in comparison to the buttress so this tells us that the termite mound has a stronger core and a porous buttress which the permeability of the buttress is also higher now we have also performed the slope stability analysis so this uh, termite mount can be idealized into two shapes it could be a triangular or it could be a trapezoid so we have taken it as an axisymmetric uh, case here and uh, so for as we have observed that the buttress and core have diff different properties in our uh, in our analysis, uh, slope stability analysis, we vary the uh, properties as obtained from our experiments along the cross section. So we linearly interpolate the pro properties. And uh, so for calculating the stability of slope, I use a strength uh, reduction factor method. So uh, I'm using more Coulomb criteria for fa identification of failure. And each time I'm reducing the strength by a certain factor. And when there's an a contiguous uh, failure surface formed throughout this uh, uh, this geometry we we identify that as a failure and the corresponding factor by which i am dividing the strength is our factor of safety now for if i consider the base infinitely rigid and take the properties i have as i have obtained from the experiments uh, for uh, the upper reason i found that the factor of safety of 46 for trapezoidal uh, mound and uh, factor of safety of 113 for the uh, triangular mound. This tells us that you know, the reality should lie in between somewhere 46 to 113, but the, in reality, the base of the mound is not infinitely rigid. So actually, when I consider the properties of the base of mound, similar to whatever neighboring soil has, so I found that if a mound of 15 meter height could be constructed con could be constructed if the factor of safety of one is considered so that is quite tall mound we don't see it in nature but this is the capability of the mound strength uh, that uh, we can have so in the man made structures we usually for ordinary structure the factor of safety is considered between 1.5 to 2 and for dams let's say it's 3 for a nuclear power plant, it could go for up to 10, but nowhere in uh, human construction we have a factor of safety of 46 and 113. Uh, so that's like a really high uh, uh, stability. Uh, it could be because uh, the termite mound has to be safe from the uh, other animals, reptiles, and uh, so on. Uh, so they might require much more stable or uh, safe uh, uh, center. Okay, so. Now I'll conclude my presentation. So we have found that the mound is a bilayered structure. And through this uh, bilayering, which, which basically you have a porous buttress and much denser core, uh, it is able to achieve a temperature and a relative, it, uh, it works as a stabilizer uh, for temperature and relative humidity. So there was one of the studies in our mechanical engineering department where they've shown that uh, if you have layered structure in which uh, you have a, core, uh, a porous, uh, first layer is porous and the bottom layer is much denser, the evaporation uh, sort of stops and uh, it, uh, it controls the whole environment. So through the, the, the bilayered structure, thermite mount are able to achieve uh, a good ventilation and because of uh, a denser core, it is able to achieve a, a high strength. So thank you.
Thank you, Sora, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to mention that everyone who has a question can type it in the comment section. Um, I have a question of my own. But when it comes to factor of safety for the slopes, uh, how you measure soil shear strengths and stresses for different samples of mound? And do you think when you analyze different mounds yeah. in different parts of the world, uh, can you see a normal dis distribution for this factor of safety or a so range the for factor them of safety is a function of uh, the material properties here so these uh, these were like basically so we are we, we are using a more coulomb uh, uh, failure envelope in this uh, so basically we have cohesion and uh, affection part for the soil uh, so so uh, we have obtained it from our uh, Unixel compression testing, and uh, there were some direct shear tests also that were performed. So from there we we got got we get this factor of safety. So the factor of safety is high because the strength uh, is much higher than the uh, the size of the mound. So for the, for this much size, we do not require the, the termite soil to have this much the, that that high strength. So I cannot actually say about the distribution of factor of safety for all the mounds, uh, but if I have the properties of all the mounds and their distribution, I can uh, I can do this uh, slope stability analysis and get it. But uh, you know, from the two mounds that we have uh, we have tested, uh, we found that the uh, results are quite consistent, and I don't think there's any issue. Yeah, I'm saying that the factor of safety is quite high for the, most of the termite mounds. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Raihana Achbari. Do you have any measurements to mm. characterize mineralogy, grain size of tested specimens for strengths, any chemical analysis of tested mound samples, any, con any contribution yeah, so from such So we have grain size distribution. Uh, uh, so this study was done by like a few researchers. So one of my senior performed, did the, the initial analysis and this would be in 2016 by Khanda Sami. So you could, uh, you could see search for termite uh, slope stability analysis on termite mound. Uh, so there you could find that uh, he, has, he has done the grain size distribution. Uh, for the chemical part, we have done uh, the EDAX. Uh, so it's basically, uh, there are two things that come in the mound soil. The, the one is the basically the surrounding soil and the other is a termite secretion. Uh, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't see anything, any, any other chemicals in the, in the mound soil. Yeah. I hope this answers the question. Okay. Perfect. And the last question, from Josh Labaki, the crazy high yeah. safety factor is very puzzling. I would expect natural structures like that to have evolved to be more material saving yeah. than ours, not less. Do, yeah, do so basically, on uh, that? yeah, most natural structures are optimum in uh, some sense. So if you see trees there, uh, they go trapezoidal, the base is much uh, uh, broader than the top part. But uh, um, termite mound, yeah, here the stability analysis is from the human perspective. I have only considered the loads uh, of the, the self weight, but uh, that's what I was telling that there, there could be a beach, breach from a, a reptile or something uh, from an external agent. Uh, so mound has to be safe from that. It's not just a uh, self fit. So yeah, so I think they are optimum in their design. I don't think uh, they have they are putting extra effort. Uh, but yeah, it's not just uh, so, so. This slope stability analysis is as we do for human structures, and that's why it is high. Uh, we cannot uh, we cannot. So if we indent it, uh, indent on it, we'll see that indentation uh, is also it will require some force. Uh, it won't be so easy. Okay. And the last question, um, there seems to be a difference in material properties between the live and dead mounds. Any ideas yeah. about that? Uh, it's not, the difference uh, is not uh, not uh, so great. Uh, let, let me go back to the presentation. Yeah, so, so if you see the, the, the abandoned mound, uh, is left there's no nothing going on there's uh, the termites are not living in there 
in in case of live mount what is happening is that and time not time upon time time again time they they basically if there was any breach if it is if it, there was rain and so they rebuild the whole thing so, they, they, so there's any any breach in the mount they will rebuild it and the properties will change if it, there was a dead mine which was left from let's say 5 years so, so the properties might not so basically it's getting cured and all those things are happening there's nothing going on in in the inside the mount so that could be one factor which which is affecting the strength and i don't see there's a great difference in the strength parameters too okay any question from this with you yeah, I had a short question. So um, if you look at the micro CT scan, it seems like there's quite a bit of sub-resolution porosity. So probably multi-scale structure. I think Kamal's work also showed this. Um, do you have any comments on that? What, uh, I mean, does that have any functionality in, in the Yeah, yeah. Definitely there would be. Yeah, so the, uh, we could not from this. So see, our CT scan has had a resolution of 13 micron. So the pores lesser than that size would not be identified here. Uh, we we had uh, access for uh, mercury induced uh, porosimetry, uh, but the thing was that it did not uh, it just stopped functioning and uh, we could not get that analysis done. Otherwise, we could have got uh, pores till uh, n in nanometer sizes. So in that sense, this uh, this analysis is restricted to only macro pores. It's not it's not uh, detailed. Uh, yeah, so in that sense, it's not. Fully. And that's I. I hope that was your question. If uh, otherwise, you could repeat it. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's fine. Thanks, uh, Muhammad. Uh, can I ask? Not ask. Leah, it's a it's a comment. So in in, the, in fact, so when we we did our studies on they, these were different mounts, uh, uh, we were fascinated with the fact that we found a prostate connector prostate. Let's say about twenty five percent. And we had probability of one Darcy, which is 10 to minus 12 meter scale. But the fascinating thing about your uh, study here, which is a different yeah, mound, I think fungus growing mound, your prostate is quite high. Yeah. It's like 50, 40 to 50 percent. It's really crazy high, and I think probability is high. I'm, I'm very curious, curious to see what you can do with the micro CT image later. It's yeah. not a question, I'm just putting as a comment. Uh, if you can run simulations on it, again, the, resolving it. A slightly higher resolution, like Tom said, with the including multi scale factor from nano scale imaging to the larger scale imaging and putting all the flow. Yeah, so, uh, so well, I, I'm very impressed. I, I think if we think. had the access to nanopores, we could get the connected porosity and then tortuosity and everything that would have been much better. But yeah, this is what we have. Like. Yeah, no, no, this is this Thank is fantastic. You. Thank you for, for the presentation. Okay, wonderful. I think now we can wrap up the session. Thank you once again, guys, for your time and these great talks. We wish you good luck with your research and your career. Our next session in two weeks will be given by, okay, yeah, yeah. Will be given by Mamta Jotkar on chemically driven convective dissolution. And the second pre presentation will be given by Ying Da Wang on deep learning and efficient simulation on digital rock analysis. I would like to thank you, our audience, again, for your support, comments, and suggestion. Please subscribe to our channel. Please contact us at prosmediattt at signgmail.com and subscribe to our mailing list. With this, we, wish, uh, we will say goodbye, and we hope to, so, uh, to see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.